Shabbat Shalom. Friends, for a while now, we've been in a storm, tossed about on raging seas, never-ending news of rockets and airstrikes and on-the-ground fighting, overwhelming our news outlets, but perhaps even more overwhelming our souls. We read in Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, the Kohl's Man Ve'et. There is a time for everything, a time for every experience. Eit Milchama, a time for war. Ve'et Shalom, a time for peace. I understand that there is a time for war, but Am Yisrael is tired. When is it going to be peace time? When will the waters settle, and when, and when will it be safe again? Perhaps this was also Noah's reality. It's pretty clear from this week's Parsha that Noah was also dealing with a situation of overwhelming destruction. Peering out the ark window, Noah must have seen the utter atrocity of homes destroyed, fields flooded, and animals and human beings alike drowning before his very eyes. He must have been so changed by this experience. Furthermore, we often think that Noah was stuck aboard this very full ark for 40 days and 40 nights, and this is certainly a long time, but it does not seem interminable. However, if you take a look at the text, you'll find that while rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights, the waters did not subside enough for passengers to exit the ark for over a year. After the one-year mark, after a year of holding on to this kind of suffering, this kind of pain, it not only feels interminable, but it makes us actually ask the question, will it ever end? This question has been on my mind a lot. Will we ever leave the ark? Will the waters ever subside? Will I ever be able to return to the land? Will they ever come home? This week, Noah and we and countless other people are asking these same questions. When will this end? When will I step out without it feeling like the floor is shifting beneath me? When will I be able to break open the doors of this proverbial ark and make my way to the place in which my home was? A few weeks ago, I heard a podcast in which the host interviewed Rachel, a mother of two who had, sur who had survived Hamas's attack on Kfar Aza, along with her two children, thank God. Long since evacuated from her ruined home, Rachel expressed how lucky she and her children have been to be hosted by so many different people around Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Rachel's family mostly stays in the second homes of those who live full-time abroad, but who own an apartment or a house in Israel as well. Her children always remark about the pictures of the other family on the walls, and often, they will take a little selfie with those pictures and send a note of gratitude to the family along with that picture. Recently, for the holidays, thanks to generous donations of American donors, Rachel and her family were moved into a resort equipped with stores to pick out donated clothes, school supplies, and other necessities. One day, her children came to her asking, whose house is this? Where are we staying today? Where are the pictures on the walls? 
Rachel sighed, audibly tired. Tired of moving, tired of being tossed from wave to wave, current to current. When will she have a home of her own again? On the other side of this equation, a dear friend of mine who has been donating her home to families like Rachel, she sees this as her duty to Am Yisrael, as I think all of us would. And I have heard in her voice the toll that it has taken to care for each family that comes to her door, to hear their heartbreaking stories, to ensure that their stay is as comfortable as possible, while she believes that this is the least she can do. She too misses having a home of her own. When will the time of war be over? When will the time of peace come, she asks. Many Gazans are also asking these same questions as well. As the numbers of refugees grow, as their homes are blasted into tiny pieces, as they journey from camp to camp to camp, searching for a place in which they might escape these waves of violence, losing family members along the way, they are exhausted. They are tired of packing up what they have into usually a very small suitcase, if that at all, of having to separate from their, from their families for safety. They ask, will we ever be reunited again? Will we ever have a home again? About six weeks ago, About six weeks ago, Miranda and I heard of the son-in-law of our very close friends, uh, a reservist in the IDF. We heard that he was badly wounded in Gaza. He was too close to an explosion, and as a result, his body, excuse me, his body ended up covered in burns just a few days ago, he passed away after all life-saving or life-preserving measures were taken. Israelis are still fighting because they have to. But it has been over a year, and they are asking, just like Noah, when will this destruction end? We cannot imagine the devastation that Noah witnessed, peering out of his ark window when the boat finally perched atop Mount Ararat. He wished for it to come to an end as well. He wished for peace rather than the chaos he saw, longing to return to his home, to his land, to feel something solid beneath his feet, he decided to send out a bird to survey the land and somehow report back. He first sent out a raven who did not return. Then Noah sent a dove. The text reads, Vayishalach et hayona me'ito. He sent out the dove me'ito from himself to see whether the waters had decreased from the surface of the ground. The dove returns, bringing only the news that it is not yet time for peace. It's not yet time to step on dry land. Noah waits and then sends her out again. This time the text reads, Shalach et hayona min hateva. He sent the dove, Min Hateva, from the ark. This time she returns with an olive branch in her beak. There is a subtle but critical difference in the text from which we can learn. The first time Noah sends out the dove, he does so mi'ito, from himself. 
This is a personal cry. God, have the waters subsided yet? May I, Noah, walk out on dry land again? Noah cries out for peace, shalom. But not the whole peace, not shlemut. But the second time, he sends out the dove, min hateva, from the entire ark. This time, as the whole world around them has been utterly destroyed, it is no longer Noah asking for this just on his own behalf or just on his family's behalf. But seeing that no one else is left, we can infer that he is asking on all of humanity's behalf, of every single person in the world. This time, he doesn't just ask for peace, shalom, but he asks for wholeness, the whole peace, shlemut, peace for all. After more than a year, when we cry out to God to please end this destruction, we realize that everyone touched by this war is a victim. The pain for parents burying children, of families broken, what we inflict on them and what they inflict on us is unfathomable. After so much time in the ark, we wonder if there will ever be an October 8th, ever a day after. God willing, there will be, but that too will be complex. The dove came back a second time with an olive branch in her beak. The olive branch is the universal sign of peace of shalom. But if you think about it, an olive branch is bitter. Olives are barely edible without being, tem without being tempered. Their oil inedible without being pressed for days. Though a victory may carry some sweetness, the bitterness will still live within us and even more so within the souls of the defeated. There's a midrash told by Rabbi Dr. Nahum Rabinovich, Zichrono Livracha, that comes to kind of, at least, answer the question of, if the only answer is bitterness, where do we go from here? Where can we go? And he tells this midrash from Midrash Tanhuma that says, Noah said to himself once he saw that the dove had an olive branch in her beak, once it was ready, it was time, the, or the world was ready for him to step out on the ark. He said to himself, well, since I only entered the ark with permission from God, shall I leave without permission? The Holy One, blessed be, blessed be God, said to him, are you looking for permission right now? In that case, go, leave the ark. Why would you wait for my permission? Rabbi Yehuda bar Eli says, if I had been there, I would have smashed down the door of the ark and taken myself out of it. No permission necessary. Rabbi Rabinovich asks the question, where was the Noah who built the ark while others looked on? Who brought all these animals aboard? Who sent forth the raven and the dove? Who wanted to get off the boat? Where was that Noah in this moment in which he had to ask for permission? And Rabbi Rabinovich, he says, honestly, this Noah who asks for permission is not a very Jewish Noah.
And Noah wasn't a Jew, so I guess it's okay. But he says that when faced with rebuilding a shattered world, one mustn't wait for permission. Rather, God expects us to just go on ahead. When we see our broken world, when we see or feel rather this bitterness inside of our hearts, we should not stay in the ark. We should not ask for permission to leave, ask for permission to rebuild. Olam chesed yibaneh. We are supposed to build this world from love. We are supposed to empower ourselves to build this world from love. May we merit the ability to call out to God, min ha teva, rather than only me'ito, from the whole ark, all of humanity, rather than just for ourselves. May we merit to call out for shalom, peace, but also shlemut, wholeness. And finally, may we merit to, without asking permission, rebuild our world when God willing, the day after this war arrives. May there be a time for peace in our day. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>